Thank you so much. Thank you so much, my old friend Kate. <laughs> uh, I want to thank the Hong Kong Studies Initiative uh, for inviting me. Oh, I oh, oh I see this yes for inviting me and and specifically for thanking professors Liu Xin and Hedy Law for organizing uh, this event. Uh, I I just feel so honored to be uh, here to share some of my research with you. Um, I think, uh, as many of you know, Hong Kong in uh, recent years uh, was mired in a lot of political turmoil. And for us who are from Hong Kong, of course, we are all very concerned uh, uh, with the future of, of, of the city. And, and I feel that maybe the young people in Hong Kong, maybe they should spend more time learning about their past, about their culture, rather than making so much noise that, that we don't know how, how futile uh, it will be. Because I really feel that uh, uh, to know a place, know a people, uh, uh, to know its folk music is of the utmost importance. And uh, Hong Kong, even though we always think of it as a we think of it as a British colony, you know, it's a colonial city, it has a, a mixed uh, history of East and West. But in fact, it's a very, very Chinese city and a very Cantonese city. So to know Hong Kong is to know Cantonese culture in Hong Kong. So I want to uh, uh, tell this story uh, about this particular singer uh, and uh, uh, actually this is a, a story Two stories. One is about this singer, of course, you'll see she, he's an amazing person. And another story is how I discovered him and how we interacted. So it's really about uh, me and him. Uh, somehow we, our paths uh, cross and uh, 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 it's really very fortunate for me. And I, I think he, at the end, he realizes it's very fortunate for him too because if he had not met me, his art would not have been preserved uh, uh, so systematically as I am trying to do. Anyway, his uh, uh, name is... Uh, uh, Do Wun in Cantonese, Do Wun, and uh, Mandarin, of course, is Du Huan. I'm sorry that... Um, uh, the image is not very large, and uh, so and this lectern blocked uh, some of the view. It's, it's, some of you are sitting in the partial view <laughs> <laughs> section. <laughs> so if you want to move up, please, please do move up. Particularly later on, I have more uh, more images of uh, song texts and so on and so forth, and they are uh, you, those sitting in the back may not be able to uh, see it. Anyway, that's his name, and he was blind. He became blind since he is about um, three months uh, old. But I will let the, the other uh, images tell uh, the story for for him uh, of him. Now, when I I I first. When I went to Hong Kong in 1974 to do my research on Cantonese opera, a friend told me about Dou Wun. And uh, he said that go to the Chinese university. Uh, uh, Dou Wun is um, uh, singing there. Uh, you know, 74 is really the early days of Chinese university. And they just started the Institute, for Chinese, uh, uh, Institute of Chinese Studies. And so I was able to hear Do Wun, and, um, and I was just fascinated by his song. And in the next couple, or two or three months, I heard him perform again. Uh, one place is the Goethe Institute. Some of you probably know in Hong Kong, it's a center for German culture. Uh, and another place is the St. Um, John's Cathedral. Uh, I always get confused, in Zhongwan, in the central. Uh, it's a very famous old uh, 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 church and where uh, 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 the central uh, office workers would go and bring their lunch. So the church 
invited him to sing these uh, nam yam, uh, to sing his song. And in each of these places, I sense that the, the audience didn't really know about Nam Yam. You know, they are either Westerners or very highly educated Hong Kong people or you know, office workers. And I feel that he must sense that too, that he's just singing to a bunch of like a blank wall. Um, so at that point, I decided that I want to record his uh, music, but not in the studio and not in a university art gallery, uh, but in an environment that he should feel that people really understood his song. So I know that Nam Yam used to be sung in tea houses. So I, with the uh, help of a local Hong Kong friend, we identified an old uh, tea house called Fu Long Cha Lao. It's no longer around now. And, um, uh, and uh, I want to, let me see. Wait, what, what happened to the sound? Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is, the, I, I actually recorded the sound at the Fulong uh, Tea House. Uh, and I don't know whether you can hear it. One very special feature is that there are a lot of bird songs. And I know that in old China, particularly in southern China, people would bring their birds to walk their birds like we walk their, <laughs> our dogs these days. And they bring it to the tea house and hang it on the, uh, on the windowsill. And uh, so, in 1975, uh, this is, as far as I know, the only tea house uh, still uh, encourage this tradition for the customers to bring their birds. Uh, so I thought, I said to myself, this is a good indication that the uh, tea house customers must be quite old fashioned and they probably would appreciate uh, Do Wun's uh, singing. And I have several pictures of the, the tea house. Uh, uh, of course, now in the mid 70s, there are fancy tea houses too, uh, air conditioned and you know, fancy waitresses. And, but th these old fashioned ones are, still, are, are very rare. Uh, and so I want just to show some other uh, images that I took at the tea house. And, uh, and some of you may remember the old fashioned tea house, uh, the, the, the waiter would carry all the hagao cha siu bao around and yell out what they, uh, what they are uh, serving. And some of you may still able to see liang gua ngao yu fan liang gua lu. Of course, this is uh, 42 uh, years ago. <laughs> And uh, so this is another view. And at the corner, you can see Do Wun. I, I went to this tea house and talked to the proprietor. I said that, could I put a singer in the corner of your tea house to entertain your, your uh, customers? And do you mind? And he said, oh, no, I don't mind, do that. Uh, and so he gave us two tables. One table is for the singer. The other table uh, right uh, to his right is for my tape recorder and an assistant. And he said, all you need is to give some extra tip to the waiter. So he's not charging me anything. But actually, the, 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 the before the, the, my uh, series of performance uh, uh, began, I put a big sign on the street officially announcing that there is a Nam Yang singer singing in this tea house <laughs> to make it more official and let Do Wun know that it's really professional, you know, it's not just any amateur gathering. This is the tea house. Some of you, I don't know whether some of you may still remember, it is um, uh, uh, on uh, Queen's Row Central, just 
uh, touching upon Queens Road West. And the side street is uh, Sui Han Hao, or Possession uh, Street. And uh, uh, there are three floors. And, um, and uh, the, the proprietor put, put me on the third floor uh, to, to, for him to perform. So we are looking east, down central, uh, Queens Road Central. Now you can already see in the uh, mid 70s, you can see these modern high rises. They are just beginning in Hong Kong. And in front of the modern high rises are the just less modern, the previous generation of uh, uh, high rises from the 50s and 60s. And then uh, these older pre-war buildings. So there are all three generations of buildings, you can still see them. This is, this is looking uh, west, uh, down Bonham Road East, towards the harbor. <laughs> so here is the, <laughs> uh, uh, the folk artist Dou Wun and the student Hong, uh, from, Hong, uh, from Shanghai. Actually, I was originally from Shanghai and then came to America. Um, uh, and uh, Dou Wun was, of course, from Xiu Hing uh, in um, Guangdong, uh, Guangdong, and somehow our paths uh, crossed. I, I thought it's really quite, uh, quite uh, uh, amazing. And uh, as I wrote, the teacher speaks and the student takes uh, notes. And then we all were busy with our tasks. So Dou Wun sang in Fu Long Tea House for three and a half months, every uh, three days every week from noon to 1.30, uh, from March 11 to June 26, for a total of 42 sessions. And each session is about one hour long with a break in the, in the middle. Uh, and, uh, and I, I, we, I, we have now published seven sets of CD, which is about only about 18 of those hours. So there's still many, many hours, but some of them, I don't know how, whether I will publish them or not. One reason is that, for instance, he sang the story of uh, Wu Song killing the fire, uh, tiger, Mo Chong Da Fu, and it went on for uh, uh, 18 hours. So I don't know whether anybody will want to buy a set of 18-hour CD. I think eventually probably the CDs will go into uh, an archive in the library. But I think the story itself, I plan to transcribe the story. That will be interesting because the Wuzong story is known all over China. And this is a Cantonese version as opposed to the Shandong version or the Jiangsu version. Now, um, I don't know how many of you know that Cantonese uh, narrative songs, there are four, five major kinds. Nam Yam, Mo Yu, Long Zhao, Yu Ao, and Ba Ngan. Now, I, I have translated them uh, according to more or less their social function rather than just say Nam Yam rather than uh, translate as southern tone, it doesn't make much sense. So Nam Yam was one of, is the best known of these five kinds, and they are sung in many places, including the tea house. And so I just call it a tea house song. The Mok Yi is, a, is a, 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 another song that's very privately sung, it's never publicly sung. It's sung by uh, people at their home, while probably by women who are working house uh, work, or by men working in the fields. So these uh, this mo has no commercial value. So uh, uh, Dou Wen uh, didn't sing the mo yu, um, and I have no. Actually, I, I did later on found somebody uh, 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 who sang mo yu, and that's the uh, uh, book I published that Kate mentioned it's uh, songs, Mokyu songs of immigration and of love. And that's uh, one of the very few Mokyu studies and recordings we have. 
no, I'm sorry. And then uh, the Longzhou is uh, literally is dragon boat, uh, so they can be called dragon boat song. But but the, its 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 most prominent function is for beggars to go around the street begging for money. They will sing Longzhou, so I just call it beggar song. And but the beggar songs, uh, Longzhou songs. Also can be sung in tea houses because they share the same repertory uh, as Nam Yam. So uh, Do Wun uh, sings that. Uh, Do, I have recordings of him singing Long Zhao, which I will play for you. Uh, the fourth kind is called Yu Ao. Yu Ao is sung mainly by women, by courtesans. So. Uh, Do Wun uh, uh, didn't sing it because it's a women's song. And finally, there is Ban Ngan, which is uh, Do Wun sings, and he sings it uh, only in brothels. He, he never sings it elsewhere. Now, I do have a recording of it, which I will uh, play for you. So uh, I will begin by um, playing a, a bit of uh, Hak Tou Chao Han Han. It's Wayfarer's Autumnal Lament. This is probably the best known Nam Yam uh, song. Uh, almost every uh, Cantonese from Hong Kong would uh, have heard of it, and Do Wun, of course, uh, knows it, and so he sang it for me, and I'm playing for you the first uh, about 10 lines. Now, Nan Yum has a very large repertory. They're of two kinds. One is more lyrical, and it's almost always about love and lost. And it lasts maybe 30 minutes or so. 
uh, and just like this one. And the texts tend to be very uh, liter uh, literary. Uh, 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 and, um, but the second kind of nam yam uh, are they are narrative songs. They, they tell stories. So for, I mentioned the Wu Song killing this tiger story. That's a, the narrative kind. And we we'll go on and on and on on very, very long stories. So uh, um, after, well, at one point uh, 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 in chatting with Dou Wun, uh, 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 I, 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 well, now certainly I've asked him to sing the narrative songs too, like the the, the, the like the Mo Chong Da Fu and Leung Tin Loi. But then he mentioned at one point that really caught my attention. He said that, oh, you know, I used to uh, 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 improvise a song when I hear a new story, say, oh, there's a big fire or, or whatever, there is a, a happy valley has a horse race or whatever. Then he will make up a song about these uh, 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 events that just happened. I thought that's very interesting because I want to hear his own creation of songs rather than just singing these standard songs that he learned from other Nam Yam uh, teachers. I said, why don't you do that? You know, uh, uh, improvise a song from a, a news item that you heard is it this morning. And he said, oh, no, 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 I don't do that anymore. I don't pay attention to news items anymore. So he refused to do that. Then I came up with an idea. I said, why don't you sing about yourself? Because you cannot say that you don't know about your own life. Just sing about yourself. Make up a song. And he, a few, at first he was very reluctant to do that. But finally he agreed to do that. And then he started singing. And he sang for six hours. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, oh, this is the first CD, uh, CD that I produced, including uh, 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 the Wayfarer's Autumnal Lament. But this is the second one. Uh, we call it Blind Do Wun Remembers His Past, 50 Years of Singing Nam Yum in Hong Kong. Uh, actually, that's his own title. He said, why don't we call it uh, uh, Blind Nam uh, Do Wun Singing uh, Nam Yum. So uh, um, now, six hours. I can't play for you, of course. I can only play for you a little bit, uh, the beginning uh, 10 uh, ten lines or so, and to me, it's the most moving song I've heard him sing. Um, now, he always speaks before he uh, sings, so I want to let you hear him speaking, sort of uh, an introduction to his song. He's rather embarrassed, you know. <laughs> I'm, don't bother reading it because I'm going to play it line by line for you. Okay? But this is the this is the prelude to his song. This is the very beginning of the six hours.
So now, that, that is, uh, uh, as I said, uh, it's, um, it's the beginning of a, a six-hour song. And I find this song uh, particularly significant because it is the only song that he, nobody else has sung. He is the one who created it, and he is the one who, who sang it. Uh, uh, so that makes... Uh, uh, the, the whole tradition of uh, uh, Nam Yam singing very special. Uh, and secondly, he's singing about himself. So if you listen to his whole song, particularly towards the end, it's so moving uh, when he uh, talks about his own life, as you can see here. I hope you, have, you, you did get to read uh, the, the, the uh, synopsis of his life that I put there. He really is a, a man of, a, uh, as he said, of a wretched life and lots of misfortune. And so it's a very poignant uh, song. Uh, in contrast to the Hato Chao Han or these other standard songs that everybody sings, and he's singing it. Of course, he sang it very, very, very well. But it's nothing personal about uh, 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 him. The third thing that's so special is that, you see, he came to Hong Kong in, at age 16, and when I recorded him, it's in 75, so it's 50 years, uh, 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 is that 50 years? <laughs> 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 uh, 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 so he talked about his life during those half a century, and in a way, he's talking about the history of Hong Kong. Because he went through all these events of Hong Kong, like uh, uh, in the 
thirties, you know, the Hong Kong government abolished uh, brothels, and and then of course the Japanese invasion and and, and the occupation and 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 uh, the red diffusion came, and that really made his life very difficult, so on and so forth. So it's really a history of Hong Kong uh, uh, seen by a blind uh, man. So I think that makes it particularly also important for Hong Kong study people. Um, the next song I want to play for you is a, a Ban Ngan song. Uh, uh, it, uh, and I translate it as a brothel song because the one said that I can only sing it in brothels. I cannot sing it anywhere else because I asked him to sing a Ban Ngan song in a tea house, in the Fu Long tea house. He said, no, 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 it's, that's impossible. <laughs> and I can't sing it in tea house. So, uh, He's, I recorded him sing, uh, uh, doing two songs. One is uh, called Lan Dai Gu, and I translated it as Rotten Big, Rotten Big Ass and uh, the Lover Squabble. And the second song is called uh, Second Uncle Chan. Uh, actually, you know, I, <laughs> I think this is where the translation issue comes up because I have done quite a bit of translation, and I learned a lot from Kate uh, when we did Dai Noi Fa. I think translating the meaning, uh, of course, it's obvious, but you want to translate the tone, and you want to use the, the, the vocabulary that reflects the Chinese vocabulary. And I find this uh, Ban Ngan, this brothel song, is particularly difficult because it's a very, very crude language. It uses so many slang, Cantonese that I cannot understand. And I consult my friends and they cannot understand. Uh, so to me, that song is very valuable for, if, if anything else, is for its text. Because since it's not sung anywhere else and brothels are no longer uh, in existence, so there's, this particular kind of song is, is no longer sung. Uh, and I do have a, a, a story about that. Now, since he's, he refused to sing it in, 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 a, in a tea house, and I understand that. Uh, and um, now, at th that time, I was living with my parents uh, in Hong Kong. And I feel that I cannot take him to my parents' house and having him sing a brothel song. Uh, uh, so luckily, my friend, uh, my Japanese friend, uh, Sai Chun Mane, uh, uh, Masato Nishimura, who live in Taipo at the time, and he's very much into Cantonese culture, and he said, come to my apartment uh, in Taipo, and you can record it uh, there. So that's where we went to his apartment. And you can see uh, Ba Ngan song uses a very different kind of musical instrument. It's a large, bold uh, uh, lute. And uh, behind him is his companion called A So. And, and I want to tell you the story about A So in relation to the second song. After he recorded the uh, uh, Rotten Big Ass, I said that now you sing Second Uncle Chan. Uh, at, first, at first he refused to sing it for me. And, and then he said, all right, I'll sing it for you, but you cannot record it. And so I, I beg and beg and beg. And finally, he allowed me to uh, record this Second Uncle Chan. And it turns out to be a, a, a totally pornographic song uh, uh, about some event in the in a brothel. And he said this song uh, has a curse on it that any woman who is a virtuous woman, which means that woman who is not from the brothel, cannot listen to it. Because if you let such a woman listen to it, then something bad will happen to her. So even though he let me record it, I have to pledge that I will never let women listen to it. <laughs> Or virtuous women. <laughs> I remember when I was teaching in Pittsburgh, I told, told the students, and of course there are men and women students, and the women students said, we are not virtuous, you can play it. <laughs> but anyway, I, no, this is a serious uh, issue, because this tape has been sitting on my shelf, and I don't know what will happen to it, because I pledge 
uh, to the one that uh, I will not just let anybody listen to it because I'll be doing something very, very harmful. You know? And so when he started singing it uh, and letting me record it, he asked his companion, Aso, he, he said, Aso, you go to the tea house and have a cup of tea. Come back in, in an hour. So, 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 so I, so I know that uh, Do Wen really took it very seriously. So I so went out, and then, then I recorded his singing, and then he, uh, uh, she came back after the recording of uh, Uncle Second Uncle Chan. But, but I can play for you, Rotten Big Ass, <laughs> but it's too long too. So I'm going to play for you only the first fifteen lines, and I try my best to translate it with the same kind of sort of earthiness and, and you know, <laughs> crude language. Um, no, that's right. And then I found, <laughs> uh, accidentally, uh, a, a, a book called Quan Fong Po. I, I translated it as Registry of Beauties. It's published in uh, 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 Canton in the early 20th century. And it's a book all about brothels. And, uh, and it's listing all the prostitutes in the west uh, city part of uh, Canton. As you can see, uh, uh, going through it, there are 21 brothels in west of city, and there are five to, and each one, there are small ones with only five prostitutes, and while well, big ones at 57, and they age from 12 to 28, but mainly uh, up to about 20. And the total, total number that's mentioned in this registry is uh, 584. And, and I, I, you know, this is quite, a, to me, a very valuable found. So I decided to, that when I play this brothel song for you, I will show some image of the prostitutes uh, just as, as a sort of accompanying uh, picture. Come 
So uh, uh, I think you can sense the, the the difference in his tone and the music. So much more lively. Yeah. The, the 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 tea house songs are are beautiful, and and the the, the text is so one uh, mana so uh, refined. Uh, uh, but this song, it, it, it's just so, uh, to me, it's, it's, a, but it's just a totally different uh, kettle of fish, but it's, uh, uh, but it's too bad it's now, no, nobody would know it. And, uh, uh, and it, it, it's like an extinct animal. And I have only recordings of two songs, and in effect only one song, <laughs> and it has been published in, in, in my third uh, CD called Ju Sai Wai Yam, including this song uh, in it. Now, I want to sh uh, play for you then the last song, uh, kind of song called Long Zhao. And um, uh, as I said, it's, uh, it's, uh, we can describe it as a beggar song because uh, uh, Dou Wen explained to me that he would uh, go you know, to beg for money and he would go in front of a, a store, business, uh, uh, and then would sing a, a beggar song, uh, sing a good luck song. Uh, and, and then he would, uh, oh, so I just want to show you, I asked him to sing uh, this uh, Long Zhao song, also in the tea house he's willing to do, because the Long Zhao songs uh, can be about narrative stories, and they share the same repertory as Nam Yam. So he, he, he sang a couple of songs in Long Zhao. I want to compare Long Zhao and Nam Yam to sing the same story uh, in these two different styles of singing. Uh, so it's a, a, a small gong and a, and a small drum. So it's a much simpler uh, kind of accompaniment. Now, when he's um, uh, uh, in front of businesses uh, begging for money, he would hold this uh, dragon boat and facing outward, uh, 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 that is if you consider di this is the storefront and he's facing the store and he's singing good luck to you and, and at the same time he would have these little men on the, uh, on the dragon boat would start uh, rowing their oars and you know dragon boat they, they row back, I mean not back, they, they row the water back and in Hong Kong of water, of course Hong Kong is, uh, I mean water is money, water is uh, uh, fortune. So. Uh, so he is so visually uh, uh, indicating that he is helping them make a lot of money. You know? And he would do that, and, uh, and if they refuse to give him money, he would turn the, uh, <laughs> the dragon boat around <laughs> and start rowing the money out of the store. So it's very effective, and people immediately give him some money. So for <laughs> so, um, I thought this is really so interesting. Now, anyway, he stopped singing a uh, 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 dragon boat song, uh, Long Zhao, but he still ha have a Long Zhao. So I asked him to bring the Long Zhao to uh, my Japanese friend's home and sing a good luck song for uh, Nishimura. Uh, and at that time, you can see that uh, 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 he, 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 doesn't, he di didn't have a stick anymore. So we improvised using his blind person stick sitting on a, a stool, uh, and then he sang a good luck uh, song uh, for, for Nishimura. Uh, and um, uh, 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 the story, <laughs> even though I know I'm running uh, late, the, the Nishimura, uh, you know, he's a Japanese uh, young man who, who loves Cantonese culture. He went to Hong Kong to work for three years, and then he decided to go to uh, America to go to graduate school. So he applied to Harvard to the literature department. So I asked Dou Wen to sing a song to wish him good luck that he can get into Harvard. So let's hear this song and then we can hear what happened to Nishimura. <laughs> <laughs> now here's some, some closer look of this uh, dragon boat. I think eventually I will uh, donate this dragon boat to some museum. I think it, it's really worth preserving. 
So you can see these little men and, and, and the oars. Um. All right, this is the one. So, the end of uh, <coughs> that's Nishimura saying, Go on, go on. Uh, the end of the story, Nishimura got accepted to Harvard <laughs> and got his PhD in Chinese literature and then went to teach at uh, UC San Diego for many decades. And even he has retired about uh, three or four years ago. So, that's a very to me. I want to think that it's because Do Wun has sung this <laughs> song. <laughs> So finally, I think I finally come to the end, and I hope that with the auspicious Dragon Ball song, I congratulate you for all for joy unconfined. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, let me just make a, uh, a pitch that the Dragon Ball, we do have a museum of anthropology. <laughs> Good. Thank you. The six hour song is the bi autobiographical song. Right? You don't confuse with these other songs. The first four hours he sang in four sessions in the tea house. So each time is oh <laughs> each time he sang for one hour with a half hour break. But then at the end of fourth hour, uh, he only reached about 1970. And by that time, I have to leave to go back to Harvard to write my dissertation. So we have to stop. But the next summer, I ask my friend Nishimura to continue uh, 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 taping his final two hours. And so 
uh, in again two sessions, uh, one hour per session. So to answer your question, you know, he, he didn't sing it continuously for six hours. Now I just want to add one more thing is that you know, can you imagine him being a blind person? He certainly cannot design his story into six chapters or 12 chapters. Even we have laptops when we can sort of juggle around. And, but everything's in his head. So his, his six hours and 12 chapters, each one is about uh, 30 minutes, all came out so naturally that at the end of the 30 minutes, he will come to a cliffhanger. And then, and then he will go on to the next session. And then next session, I'm just so amazed that he's such a creative person in, in a literarily uh, creative to be able to make up such a complicated story uh, 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 just all in his head. He said only once, yes. So if he was to sing it again, would he be able to sing it word for word? Probably not, probably not this song. Uh, no, of course, he's, he died in 1979. Right. I, I recorded him in 1975, but after four years, he passed away. I'm sure, uh, well, I'm not sure, but probably he would remember something else and improvise and add other things. Now the other standard songs, he would probably sing word by word. So he was improvising on the spot. Yeah. Well, I think he must have, before he came, he think about it and planned it, uh, not right there. That's why it's organized so well. So was it rhyming too, like the, the whole verse? Because some of them, you know, Yes, that's right. It's all the more important. It's not just telling the story. It's all in, uh, in verse structure. Now, he's a little bit free with that because I can understand. Not, they don't all rhyme uh, uh, correctly. And also, the end of the, uh, the nam yam is in, uh, is in a quatrain form. So the last syllable of first line is uh, uh, oblique. Uh, 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 tone, uh, and then the second line is upper even tone, third line is oblique tone, and fourth line is lower even tone, for those of you who know about Cantonese tones. So he has to try to follow even these things, in addition to the stories. <laughs> yes? Did he ever talk to you about this composition uh, process? No. <laughs> I'm afraid not. I mean, he's very reluctant even to sing this song. Uh, uh, um, you know, in this passage uh, I play for you, when uh, it's his introduction to his song, he talked about it. Uh, he used the Cantonese uh, uh, sentence ending, wo, uh, to imply that I've been asked to do it. No, he didn't want to do it. <laughs> And, uh, and I thought that's a very, I like the Cantonese language, this is another reason. All these sentence particles are so, so meaningful, you know, subtly, uh, uh, just adding one syllable, it changes the whole, whole, whole tone of the sentence. No, we never talked about the uh, compositional process, yeah. I've got two questions, sort of. Why is it that when you speak Cantonese, I can more or less understand you, but when with him singing, I couldn't understand any of it, but I heard something about, you know, he said East, West, South, or something, but I, I don't know, why is it that in the singing, it's different from the yeah. verbal or vocal? I guess, uh, no, I understand. Part of it is to getting used to uh, the Cantonese being sung. You probably heard very little Cantonese being sung. You only heard it being spoken. So once you get used to it being sung, then you will be able to understand it. Uh, uh, um, right, yeah. It is a matter of getting used to. Okay. My second question is, he seems to be rather educated, and yet he, we don't, you know, he ran away, and he, he had this person, he ran away from this person at age 8 or 10. Mm -hmm. So he, you know, he seems to be rather educated. How does this happen? What do you mean, agitated? Or educated. Yeah. Oh, educated. Yeah. <sighs> He's not educated at all. He never went to uh, any school to study. No, he's blind. 
that, that's why I said it's even all the more amazing. He he cannot use the laptop to, to compose a song. You know, it's all, he learned all these words and rules and sentences from from his uh, memory of all these other Nam Yam songs, and then he digested them and abstracted them, and then come out with his own song. Okay. You did say you did have a master or somebody. Yes. Well, uh, uh, if I remind you, uh, at uh, uh, eight he ran away from uh, the first person who's a charlatan. The, the family gave him to a fortune teller who's who really didn't know anything about fortune telling. So, so after a few years, he, he realized that there's no point you know, in, in staying with him. So he ran away to uh, Guangzhou and, and to, uh, uh, to the, uh, it's a bridge called Wang Zhikiu, and that's where all the blind person uh, gather. So he somehow he found that, so he found many other uh, blind people there. And that's where he met his, uh, a teacher of Nam Yam eventually, and he studied with this teacher for several years. And his teacher would then take him to his various jobs, you know, to let him you know, carry things or whatever. So, and that's uh, how he really learned uh, all the standard repertory. And, and, and as I said, and then he came to Hong Kong at age 16 to start his own professional career. I, I want to thank you for like the context you've given because you reminded, well, even if he was blind, he can't use a laptop. Well, 1975, 70s, I mean, there was no laptop. There's also no laptop. Huh? And I think maybe picking up from, he seemed to be educated, uh, maybe we could say it was in that traditional education right. of master, disciple, right. Uh, tradition. That's right. Um, so he had, we'll say, a deep education, but it was, you know, before academics and hours right. of credit. Very good. Um, so I'm really pleased that you were able to share that. Right. I'm thinking of he respected a tradition, and uh, maybe he went beyond a tradition as well. So I'm thinking of like blind guy, like blind Lily McTell. So I mean, there's like blues singers that were blind. But I'm also thinking he was uh, that intuitive rapping before, you know, what, say, New York City rapping. But there is that Chinese tradition of rapping. And uh, I, could, I could hear the clackers and things and some of that. So I'm really pleased that I was, I read about it in the paper about an hour ago. I came out here. Well, thank and you. I'm really and, and thank you for your comment. It's very good. So, yeah. you know, I, I think if that makes sense uh, to our conversation right. and I think really addresses right. some right. of the questions that were. Right. Actually, insofar as comparing him to some Western uh, person, uh, I would compare him to the Greek blind poet singer Homer. Uh, way back into the whatever, 7th century BC. It's a very similar situation because here is a blind person who sang these very, very long songs, even longer than, uh, than Douwen songs. So it, it's a tradition, I think, that, that must have existed in many, many cultures, uh, singing songs, for blind people to sing songs. So uh, we are just very lucky to be able to, uh, to catch him and record him and tell his story, while most other blind singers are probably lost uh, in history. Well, I yeah. appreciate that uh, you've documented a living art, mm -hmm. and that you know, someone isn't going to re-sing the exact words as a record because it is a living art and that you've captured that sort of moment in time. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, let me see if there are any, one, any other questions. I have another question. How did the patrons, so we'll come back to you. How did the patrons of the tea house respond to this performance? Oh, tea house is fine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he did. Well, uh, oh, oh, oh yes, yes. One thing is that I, because I have the microphone or record, uh, so during the breaks I taped some customers coming up to him and chat with him. He said, "Oh, you know that song I used to hear uh, uh, so and so sang it, some Masi Zhang sang it, or, or uh, somebody sang it." And so they chat about, it. and I think that's very important to him. That's my theory. So he was not singing to a 
blank wall. That's exactly, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, go ahead. Is he told to blind, or can he actually see some shell? I think he can. Uh, yeah. I think, yes. Yes. Yeah, good question. Uh, uh, he can see some shadows. Yeah. Not not one hundred percent blind. You know. Now the, the music is a good question. Uh, the music has been uh, transmitted orally for for many uh, generations. It's the same melody. Uh, so nobody composed a new melody. So he simply composed a, a text to to fit the, the the traditional melody. And you might may ask, yes. as a historian, I'm interested in the state of the tradition. Now that's a very good question. Um, uh, these days in Hong Kong, uh, there is a small group of people very interested in uh, learning to sing Nam Yom, and even including a small number of young people. And so now, are we going to cultivate it and encourage them? And well, I have second thoughts because uh, uh, this kind of singing, he sings like this because he's a professional singer. If you are just a you know, a student or a university professor, and, and imitate his singing uh, uh, by by uh, parroting a song that he has sung. That is not really a living tradition. Um, I think this tradition uh, has died for a, a professional singer who made make a living. Uh, by singing these songs. I don't think anybody can survive. So if you, you can certainly encourage young people to learn to sing, but I wouldn't uh, encourage, uh, encourage them to, to rely upon it to make a living because, because there's no, not a market anymore. Yeah. First of all, I want to congratulate you for just bringing the story to life. You're just such a physicist. But as a Chinese, it's lovely to be able to relive our past. Yes. And I just want to let you make one little point. Um, I've been a, a teacher of Rosa, sorry, I've been a, a student of Rosa, learning about Cantonese opera singing mm -hmm. for a number of years. So I'm still very new to this. Right. But I do know that songs like Nam Yam uh -huh. and Bong Yu, yeah. they've been incorporated as That's part right. of the very repertoire. Good. Yeah. So like you said, yeah. the melody is there, yeah. and nobody will change it, right. but it's just the words. That's right. Okay. And, and I have to say that, you know, they just, to me, they're the fabric of what Cantonese music is about. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it just brings everything to life. Yes, very good. And it's, it's such, it brings me personally, and yes. I'm sure a lot of people, yes. lots of enjoyment. Thank you so much. That's exactly what I want to hear from, <laughs> from my audience because that's the whole point about, about bringing these uh, folk music into life because you, you remind yourself about your childhood, isn't it? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, is it Nathan? Uh, Alison, oh. um, This is a slightly different topic, but um, I just saw a documentary last year uh, of a, a singer, a blind singer in Inner Mongolia who performs at uh, funerals. Mm -hmm. um, he was blinded because he was um, sleeping with another man's wife. Mm -hmm. um, and he, his performances are very crude and vulgar, and it's errant high. So he sings with a woman performer as well often, and does, sings with clappers. Right. And, um, but he also performed his own story. Mm -hmm. Story of his the, of the attack that blinded him, and so I was just interested. He's yes. also a drug addict and a gambler. <laughs> <laughs> and not a very nice person, but, yes. but it's a very it's a fascinating documentary. That's right. That I show good film uh, classes. Yeah, very good. I, I yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So there are good. Good. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
actually it's already uh, online in Hong Kong there is something uh, uh, this was almost 10 years ago now uh, Hong Kong you uh, put together a Hong Kong memory project oh, and you probably many of you know it and uh, so uh, uh, we put some of the material into the Hong Kong memory project so you can access some of these songs and uh, including some of my articles and, and the song texts. Uh, probably you can, you'll be able to access yeah, it. Just yeah, Google yeah, Google yeah, Google. yeah, right. You, you find him there. Yeah. But I don't think it's the complete uh, ones. And uh, uh, for, for the other complete texts, uh, buy our CD sets. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. You have been such a wonderful audience. So I think we have exhausted you. Yeah. Oh, no. no, no.